Should we start? Okay, maybe you will start. Kita mulai aja ya. Yeah. Ya. Sudah bisa di admit admitin Satrio. Oke, okay, oke. Okay. Oke, okay, good evening everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, it's, an honor, it's an honor for us to help this event. It has been two months uh, since our last party history. Uh, in case most of you are new to party history, uh, let me brief, briefly introduce Sejarah Lintas Batas as the organizer of this event. Uh, Sejarah Lintas Batas, or History Without Borders, is an association of historians from various backgrounds of field, field work, including lecturer, journalist, uh, researcher, and also creative workers, which has a common interest in raising public awareness on historical thinking and any related matters in general. Uh, today, party history will be special because it will be the first time we invited someone from abroad. We have Mr. Titi Jamkar John Kayat here. Hello, Mr. Titi. Uh, and also, it will be the first time party history will be conducted in English, but you know, uh, it will also, if Miss, uh, Mr. Titi uh, will be also will be conducted with, with, with Indonesian. Uh, and the honor for moderating this discussion will be presented to Muhammad Fawaz Nuruddin. Uh, Fawaz is a student from University of Indonesia, majoring in communication studies. Uh, he's also a member of Serikat Mahasiswa Progressive UI, uh, University of Indonesia Student Union. So for the rundown, initially Fawaz will introduce Mr. Titi and then Mr. Titi will deliver his speech or, or, or notion. And then the last is Q&A or discussion session. Uh, also, we hope every attendee, uh, we hope every attendee could fill the attendance list through the Google form link on the chat column. And if anyone need uh, the program's certificate, they could fill the form also in the chat column. Um, okay, maybe without further ado, please welcome Fawaz Nuruddin. Um, good afternoon and good evening, um, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. And also, I'm here to welcome Mr. Titi, who is also going to present maybe a lot of insight and a lot of information for us and for everyone here. So without further ado, I want to introduce Mr. Titi. And so he is currently an assistant professor of Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Victoria, Canada. He also received his PhD in South and Southeast Asian Studies with a designated emphasis in critical theory from the University of California, Berkeley. He works at the intersection of Marxism, post-anti and decolonial theories, and more specifically, modern Southeast Asia, which is uh, located in Indonesia and Thailand. His essays and interviews have appeared in Kyoto Review of Southeast Asia, Spectre, Hey Market Books, and Asia Art Tours. His first book project is a, is a global intellectual history of black internationalism in Indonesia during the post-colonial transition. Good afternoon, Mr. Titi. Good afternoon, Nawaz. Yeah, how, are you, how are you doing, sir? Uh, I'm doing great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm very flattered and um, very happy to be here. Of course, of course, we are here. Uh, of course, very honored to have you presenting. So maybe without further ado, um, you can start uh, presenting your uh, materials and we could start the discussion, sir. All right, so um, thank you very much, both uh, Mas Usup and Mas Fawas uh, for the very kind introduction. I, well, at first I thought it's going to be Bahasanya uh, Campuran, Indonesian dan Inggris, but the introduction seems to indicate that it's going to be all in English, so um, which 
would make the presentation somewhat or the dialogue somewhat uh, going a little bit faster uh, because if I only speak Indonesian, it would take such a long time for me to come up with words. Um, but I have to first uh, um, say this, that um, this time that I'm speaking, ini untuk buat dialogue aja, uh, bukan presentasi atau laporan. So this is only a dialogue that I'm really wishing to make with my kawan-kawan uh, di Indonesia, in my Indonesian comrades, uh, who helped me along the way of thinking about this question of the his intellectual history of the left in Indonesia. And I actually need to acknowledge um, many of you who are here who actually have been helping me immensely when I was in Indonesia, uh, particularly I want to emphasize the assistant of uh, Mas Satrio, uh, who is here, uh, Mas Andi, uh, Bu Lila, uh, Bu Ita, who have helped me tremendously when I was in Indonesia. So um, any of the mistakes I'm going to make is going to be mine, but I'm really uh, hope that this conversation will be open-ended uh, for all my Indonesian comrades to engage with my thoughts and also the materials that I'm speaking about today. Um, today, it is more like an overview of what I have been doing, um, which uh, some of you may know that I have just um, uh, filed my dissertation. So my research is really recent and many of them I presented this for the first time. So uh, please excuse me if some of the uh, materials or some of the thoughts are still very jumbled um, or not as and not present, presented in the clearest way possible. So I'm really anticipating um, productive feedback or a conversation uh, after this sort of discussion of materials. And um, today's discussions consisted of three parts. The first part is about my main interpretive frameworks of left internationalism and peripherality. So that would reflect uh, the title of this talk that um, Sintas has actually assigned for me, which is left internationalism, Indonesia and the world. So that would be the first part of um, this discussion. The second part would be about left third worldism um, uh, in Indonesian. I'm actually not so sure yet what would it be. So it would be um, dunia ketika, apa, um, dunia ketika isma, <laughs> maybe something like that. I'm not so sure. And then the third part is about minor communist internationalism. Um, and again, like I don't have an Indonesian term for this yet. So maybe some of you could help me think of a better term. So it would be uh, internationalism, uh, minor communist. So I think that would be the direct um, transliteration or like, like direct translation into Indonesian. Okay, so let me start. And why I'm interested in this question of uh, left internationalism and peripherality. So I have a few questions um, that, um, that emerged when I was researching on the history of the Indonesian left, particularly in the 19, in the, during the period of 1940s to 1960s. And uh, three questions came to my mind. The first question was, why was the Indonesian left particularly the PKI, so invested in producing theory that shares analytics with those of other communist parties. For example, uh, the PKI not, was not talking about only uh, Indonesian nationalism, but it was also talking a lot about like, what is the shared condition of imperial, imperialism between Indonesia and other places, for example, it, you know, maybe in West, the question of West Papua, the question of uh, Malaysia, the question of um, imperialism elsewhere, the question is why? And the second question was, why were these so many, why were there so many instances of international praxis undergirding the Indonesian left anti-colonial nationalism that seem to be under theorized? So that's also uh, another question that I have. So if you flip through, let's say, uh, Harian Rakyat or Bintang Mera, especially after the 1960s, you'll see it's not the news that the PKI shared in those newspapers are not just about Indonesia. It's about what? It's about, uh, you know, French colony in Africa, for example, or like uh, the decolonization of in Cuba or in Peru or in some other parts of the world. And then the question is like, why 
there are so many instances of these international practices that seems to be under theorized. And then the third question that I had when I was uh, researching on the topic was, um, how do we study leftist innovations within the constraint of restricted Marxist-Leninist idioms? So why did this question emerge? Because usually um, during the 1960s, there's always this opposition between the party Marxists and the non-party Marxists. And the non-party Marxists would be totally outright critiquing Stalinism, saying that, oh, like we are the left, but we are not a part of the Communist Party tradition anymore. But the PKI that I'm actually studying, that I'm that I studied uh, in the research are were still within the tradition of Marxism-Leninism. So the question is, it went within the constraint of Marxism-Leninism, could we still see some kind of theoretical innovation emerging out of this tradition rather than going to the non-party leftist route? So those are the three main questions that I had when, um, when I, I study about this topic. Uh, now let me introduce uh, my two main analytics uh, here, which are left internationalism and peripherality. And I know that this could be sort of maybe arbitrary terms, I don't know. But like for me, I'm going to persuade some of you that I think these two terms are very significant for my own approach to, um, as I said, leftist innovations within the constraint of restricted Marxist-Leninist tradition. And I take these two, so this is my main argument in, um, in the dissertation or in my own research. I take these two as the paired subjective and objective conditions for a global revolution against capitalist totality. So what do I mean when I talk about left internationalism as a subjective subjective condition and peripherality as an objective condition. So I think some of you, if you are familiar with reading Lenin's text or maybe even Idit's text, you would see these two terms coming up a lot, uh, condici subjective and condici objective. And why they are so important is that if only pure subjectivism is only arbitrary, right? Like if we want to do a revolution, we just think that, oh, we are already in a revolutionary period. So then whatever we're doing is going to be revolutionary. That is wishful thinking. So that's the uh, pitfall of pure subjectivism. But then the pitfall of pure objectivism is also that, oh, right now we are in the capitalist milieu. So when we're in a capitalist milieu, there is no revolutionary possibilities because everything surrounding us is already fully um, immersed in the capitalist production, right? So if, if we only talk about the objective condition without thinking about subjective condition too, then it also means that there is no possibility for revolution. I think a more dialectical approach to think about the revolution against the capitalist totality is to think about both the subjective condition of objective condition. And that is why, again, that is why when you are reading people like Lenin, uh, people like Marx and people like I did, they always talk about this two pair um, in a very interconnected way, always, all the time. So that is why I have to emphasize the importance of thinking both in subjective terms and objective terms. I hope this is clear. Um, and uh, I'm sorry if this is new to some of you. I'm just, <laughs> I'm talking right away, imagining that my, my audience, everyone is somewhat familiar already with the, uh, some of the PKI texts. But if um, I, I'm not making myself clear enough, uh, or like, uh, yeah, if I'm not making myself clear enough, feel free to um, write in the chat uh, for me to clarify. Okay, now subjective and objective condition. What do I mean by internationalism and peripherality? And why do I think internationalism is a subject, subjective condition and peripherality is an objective condition? So internationalism for me means an empowering praxis of cooperation that connects Indonesian Marxism to other contemporaneous leftist struggles against capitalism, imperialism, and racism. This is going to be clearer when, I'm, when I am presenting um, 
uh, the section on left third worldism and uh, minor communist internationalism. But for now, this is the definition. Internationalism is an empowering praxis of cooperation that connects Indonesian Marxism to other contemporaneous leftist struggles against capitalism, imperialism, and racism. Some of the examples would be left third worldism and minor communist internationalism. We will all see, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. And then um, the second definition is peripherality. Peripherality for me manifests a shared material condition between Indonesia and countries in the periphery of global capitalism that has otherwise been kept separate by the capitalist and imperialist oppressors. What are those conditions? Capitalist exploitation, imperialist subjugation, racialized sexualized domination. Have you ever wondered? So this is sort of like the, the question that came up to me. Have you ever wondered why there is no um, both like material and theoretical cooperation between Indonesia, uh, Suriname, and the Dutch Antilles in the Caribbean, even though the three of them were Dutch colonies. And I think these kind of connection are very interesting to me to see like why all these like countries that could actually could have been cooperating with one another were kept separate from one another. Um, so they could not uh, collab collaborate with one another in order to fight a bigger systemic oppressive power like Dutch colonialism or capitalism, for example. So for me, why focusing on peripherality is exactly that, to see a shared material condition between Indonesia and countries in the periphery of global capitalism that has otherwise been kept separate by the capitalist and imperialist oppressors. Again, this will be clearer when we get to the, um, I hate to use the term case studies, but it's something to be like more concrete and more specific after. And then, so uh, to give another example, during Marx period, when Marx was writing Capital, he was really concerned with one particular question. During that time, we have to understand it was at the height of British colonialism, right? And then there is one question that Marx, Karl Marx, was so invested in, which is the question that is called the Irish, the Irish question. And what Marx stands on the Irish question, do you know where Irish is? Like, you know, like Great Britain, and then there is like Ireland, like uh, at the other smaller island to the left of Great Britain, right? And for Marx, his position in the Irish question is that the national liberation of Ireland is a precondition for the proletarian revolution in Britain. What does that tell us? This Irish question actually tells us that for Marx, the precondition for global proletarian revolution in the center has to start from the periphery. It's not until Ireland gets into gets national liberation that we could have a larger global revolution in the center. So you can already see during March time, he was already interested in the question of peripherality and also internationalism, because Mark also talking about the cooperation between the, work, the Irish worker and the immigrant Irish worker in Britain, and also the British proletariat, the cooperation between them cross nation, which is an internationalist gesture that would be able to tear down the larger British colonial system. So you already see during Marx's time, this paired question of internationalism and peripherality was already there. So what I've been trying to do is actually to inherit this Marxist tradition that has already been inaugurated during Marx's time from the Irish question. And then I, I trace it to the present, talking about international and peripherality uh, from the point of view of um, Indonesian leftist tradition. And then you already see in the slide that um, it's left in nationalism, subjective, peripherality, objective, and it's all talking about global revolution against capitalist totality. Uh, I'm not so sure whether I should talk about this, uh, whether it's like too much derailing, but anyways, since I already have it um, on the slide, the question would be, oh, not yet, um, that's the next one. 
why are these pair analytic important? So why is left why are left international internationalism and peripherality important? Um, let's think about this. So in the current moment, there's there is a kind of analytics that is very problematic, and we call this strain of analytics a tanky type of problematics. And what does what do peripherality and internationalism help us not reproducing that tanky position? And what does a tanky mean? Tanky means that you are blindly just um, blindly just following the um, the power the the power full communist position, either of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, or the Soviet Union Party, allowing them to um, further uh, any of their imperialist impulses in any other countries, like just like blindly following what the CCP says or blindly following what the Soviet Union say. For example, uh, the tanky analysis, um, uh, the example of tanky analysis would be, oh, we are the left we must support whatever the Chinese Communist Party would, is doing, including the invasion of Hong Kong, including the invasion of Taiwan, because Taiwan and Hong Kong are capitalist bourgeois, bourgeois country. So the action of China, the CCP's invasion of Hong Kong and Taiwan is legitimate. So that is a tanky position, which is actually very problematic. And how do peripherality internationalism help us not making an a tanky analytics. So peripherality actually rescues left analysis from ad identifying with the oppressors, right? Because if you are making an analysis from the peripheral point of view, you're already making a leftist analysis from a position positionality of mostly the oppressed rather than the oppressor. So when you are making an analysis from the peripheral point of view, it rescues the left analysis from identifying with the oppressor. So that's the usefulness of peripherality now. And the usefulness of internationalism is that internationalism prevents the analysis from reaching an anti-dialectical and authoritarian solution, a position which is now widely called tanky. Why? Because if we have an internationalist approach um, to leftist analysis, we would not just follow what the CCP say. We would actually look at the proletarian or the working class connection between let's say the Cantonese or Taiwanese migrant in China and also the Chinese working class. Looking at the international yeah. connection, looking at the internationalist um, uh, 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 connection between um, the migrant worker in China and also the, uh, the Chinese working class itself. So it means it is the analysis from below rather than having a leftist analysis from the party point of view. And that is what internet, that is the usefulness of internationalism. Hopefully I make that point clear that uh, both in my point of view, peripherality and internationalism is useful in contemporary leftist analysis, not just in my dissertation, it's applicable elsewhere. Um, to not um, lead us to that pitfall of tanky analysis of tankyism. All right. And um, in my dissertation, I also try to develop what I would call a peripheral Marxist method. And um, I think in the dissertation itself is going to be like uh, citing a few uh, theoretical gestures that I think would be very sophisticated, but here are some of the hot takes. So here are some of the basic points of what I think is my own peripheral Marxist method or interpretive method in, in studying um, uh, uh, intellectual history of leftism in Indonesia. So um, these are some of the uh, points. So the first point is that it analyzed a new multiple geohistorical material forces operating in different scales, rhythm, and frequencies. What Antonio Gramsci, I, I saw someone use Gramsci as their profile picture, Gramsci and Stuart Hall uh, call the conjunctural forces. 
that matter to leftist transformational politics in concrete conditions situation. And I would say, okay, these words, conjunctural forces, geohistorical material forces might sound mouthful, but I'm also going to show you and you see in the last point that it actually resonates with IDIP's own analytical point. So the first point is, is analysis the conjunctural forces and you. You cannot be a lazy Marxist, right? That it, start, it starts not with the law or with the dogma, but it always have to start with a situated conjuncture and problematic in relation to Marxist presupposition. So that's the second point. It starts from a situated conjuncture and problematic, not starting from a law or a dogma. We can like peripheral Marxism or peripheral Marxist method coerce you to not be a lazy thinker or a lazy Marxist. And then the third point is that uh, peripheral Marxist method is situational and innovative. And that's mostly uh, Lenin's discourse that one needs to be always situational when one, is, when, when one is coming up with a Marxist analysis. And also one needs to be innovative in trying to uh, discern the emerging and, um, and uh, uh, consistent forces at play at that moment in time. Now, uh, in Idit's discourse itself, um, I think after 1954, which is the uh, fifth national congress of PKI, um, uh, in, in, in that conference, they came up with the term Tao Marxisme Kanao Kedaan. What exactly are those? Tao Marxism, you have to know your Marxism. Kanao Kedaan, which is knowing the condition or knowing the situation, which is what? Which is, what exactly Stuart Hall and Gramsci were saying earlier, that we have to know the conjunctural forces uh, before we make a Marxist analysis. Um, and then I did, and also Pekai after 1954, also came up with this term that, we, that uh, the good leftist analysis needs to analyze concrete situation and know the balance of forces, which in Indonesian is keseimbangan kekuatan. So, that is what, again, is the emphasis on the conjunctural forces. Need to be situational, seeing what are the emerging forces, seeing what are the residual or the consistent forces, and see how are these forces interplay with one another. Looking at the keseimbangan kekuatan, the conjunctural forces. Again, so I'm, I'm just saying that PKI and IDIS discourses already resonate with um, what the non-orthodox and non-dogmatic Marxists have been talking elsewhere, including Gramsci and Stuart Hall. Uh, and I did was also talking about um, when one is doing analysis, one needs to not doing a direct application. Bukan aplikasi langsung, harus riset dulu. So I think that's the, that's the discourse. And then um, there is one good example. Um, of I did practicing what I would say peripheral Marxism here, <laughs> situational innovative, right? Um, which was in 1963. Nin in 1963, I did led a research group on West Japan Javanese Patani or peasantry. And he came up with a more fried grain analysis of the peasantry's social stratification. So he came up with, I think, I, I cannot remember five to seven kind of Patani, but Patani Miskin, Patani Kaya, and then many others, for like social stratification of peasantry. And uh, I did also came, I did and his research team also came up with um, the peasantry's class enemies, which was named uh, Setan Desa or rural devils from this research. Um, and why is this research important? And why is the year 1963 so important here? It was important precisely because he was looking, he was doing this research, situational research, to look at the prospect of the agrarian movement or the agrarian revolution after the Land Reform Act was implemented. Do you see what is the conjunctural force here? The conjunctural force, which is also a turning point. A turning point here is 1961. In Ida's mind, when he was conducting this research was that there is a difference of the peasantry or the Patani social structure before 1961, before the implementation of uh, 
uh, Land Reform Act and after the implementation of Land Reform Act. And that's why 1961, 1963, these, um, that's why it is important for IDIP to conduct research about agrarian movement once again after 1961. So this is my example of telling you how I did or the PKI was already doing this peripheral Marxist method by being situational, being innovative, and, and analyzing keseimbangan kekuatan. Tahu Marxisme kenal keadaan. This is very important. That's why I'm emphasizing this so much. That tahu Marxisme kenal keadaan is actually also my a mantra when I was conceiving this dissertation uh, research as well. So you kind of see my sort of uh, intellectual lineage here. Why is Indonesia important? Um, maybe this is a given um, in the, you know, when I'm talking to Indonesian uh, leftists or when I'm talking to the Indonesian crowd, but if I'm talking to people outside of Indonesia, people who are not knowing one thing about Indonesia, why Indonesia is important in this research or why it is like the center of uh, my study of peripheral Marxism um, and left internationalism was that it was, the, many of you may know, it was the largest communist party in a non-communist country, right? So besides the Soviet Union and China, Indonesia communist party in the 1960s, it was the largest communist party in a non-communist country. Second, it was the center of some form of third worldism when can think of Bandung and minor communist internationalism, which I would argue that uh, Indonesia was also one of its center. And who were the member of the minor communist internationalism? As you will see later, it would be Indonesia, not... I would argue that Indonesia was the center for both some form of third worldism and also minor communist internationalism. That's why Indonesia was important. And the third um, reason was um, uh, the 1965 to 1966 killings um, has already eradicated all the um, leftist materialist basis in Indonesia. So um, writing an intellectual history after the 1965-66 killing, uh, for me, I would argue or I would defend that it's an ethical issue of recovering uh, a, a tradition, a worldview, um, and um, intellectual legacy that has been totally or completely destroyed. So it's also an ethical uh, imperative to write about um, the Indonesian left after 1965-1966. So those are the three reasons why Indonesia is important. And then let me get to um, my main point that I'm going to talk today, which is a transition to the second part. So those uh, that I just talked was the first part. Um, I think when one think about uh, Marxism, forms of Marxism in the 1950s, 1960s, um, one main form of uh, Marxism one dominant form of Marxism, when everyone think about official Marxism, right, from the 40s, 60s, would be Soviet Marxism or Stalinism. But what I would argue, and I think this could be a little bit far-fetched, but let me say it first, and then I would refocus it back to Indonesia, is that many forms of internationalism that I study in the 1940s, 1960s, that Indonesian leftists were involved, were actually very interested or very invested in opposing or trying to transcend this Stalinist legacy. Meaning that uh, they are not trying to reproduce some kind of Stalinism dogmatism, rather they're trying to contest or trying to revise or trying to transcend that kind of Stalinist legacy that they inherit in the party, in the Marxist Leninist tradition. And there are three forms that I see uh, for the 60 Marxism that try to transgress or try to transcend or try to oppose or try to revise uh, Stalinism. Uh, the first one, which I'm not going to talk about is Maoism. Um, and what is Maoism here um, in my formulation is that it's a return to dialectics 
uh, to oppose some kind of Stalinist instrumentalization, no dialectics. Uh, Soviet Union is uh, the absolute communist power. So there's nothing else, there's no more development. Maoism come to revise that saying that no, Soviet, Soviet Union is not the absolute pinnacle of communism. There should be, um, there could be some kind of regression, there could be some kind of dialectical movement even after the Soviet Union has already achieved what Stalin would call highest form of communism. So that's Maoism, but we're not going to talk about that. The second form of uh, 60 Marxism or like uh, a form of internationalism too is left third worldism. And what it did was coming up with a kind of geo-historical materialism, looking at a world in a framework of uneven development, seeing sort of different uh, historical and geographical developments of different parts of the world, as opposed to the abstract reductionism of Stalinism. Again, like when one thinking about Stalinism, one actually don't see much of natural difference, right? Stalin came up with the idea of socialism in one country, which actually means like saying that, oh, there is this uh, ideal type of communist country that every other country, regardless of their history, regardless of the geography, should follow and, um, and reach that position. But left third worldism saying, no, actually there are historical and geographical differences between each country. Indonesia was a Dutch colony. Cambodia was a French colony. Uh, Philippines was Spanish and American colonies. How could these countries have the same path to communism? Like, what, like what Stalin said. So that what left third worldism um, uh, uh, came up with geo-historical materialism to revise that kind of abstract reductionism. And the third form of 60 Marxist alternative is what I call minor communism. And what was minor communism was sort of um, these um, minor communist countries peripheral to the big communist countries that, also, that contend with the idea of big country chauvinism. So the members of um, the minor communist internationalism for me were Indonesia, Albania, and North Korea. And I think if you think along my line of thinking, you would see how. North Korea is peripheral to China. Therefore, North Korea always have to contend with the possibility of the Chinese Communist Party invading them. Albania was peripheral to the Soviet Union. Again, there's always this threat of a big country like Soviet Union having some kind of communist imposition on Albania, while Indonesia is a very interesting case. It's peripheral to everywhere. It's, uh, it's peripheral to China, peripheral Soviet Union. And that's why for me, I think, well, people who know the uh, IDIT tradition well could contest me, but what I think it was in IDIT's mind in that time was, oh, since Indonesia was already peripheral to everywhere, to China, to Soviet Union, it could actually be a center of minor communist internationalism. It could be another center, not a center like China or Soviet Union, but center to all other minor communist countries like Albania or North Korea. So I have some kind of um, uh, backup here, but um, uh, I will present later. So this is a large overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about in the second section right now, on left third worldism. And on the third section, it's going to be about minor communist internationalism. Hopefully this is clear. It's going to be clearer. Okay, so come up with the uh, second section on left third worldism. What do I mean by left third worldism? So I propose here that left third worldism, left third worldism, is a Marxism premise on an understanding of the world as an intertwined capitalist and imperialist system, materialized here, as I will show, through logistical infrastructure, like military bases, seaports, and airports. So this is, this is what makes left third worldism different than the metropolitan Marxism. Metropolitan Marxism sometimes don't aware or even marginalize or even um, uh, downplay the imperialist question. But left third worldism is always seeing capitalism and imperialism as an intertwined system. Hopefully this is clear. And then 
I also suggest that one oppositional strategy unique to left third worldism is a form of circulation struggle. I will explain more. In this, clay, in this case, the strategy of boycotting ships and planes at the logistical choke points. So um, left third worldism here uh, in my study is represented by uh, this, I think, understudy Indonesian internationalist by name of Ibrahim Isa. I will introduce him more and more later, but let's look at this quote first. So this is a quote from Ibrahim Isa in 1962. Um, in the uh, uh, in the speech called the Liberation of West Irian and um, I actually cannot read um, West Irian and Imperialist Maneuver in the Middle East. So we can read together. On behalf of the Indonesian people, I call upon the workers of Port Said, Suez Canal, Cairo Airport, Beirut Airport, Damascus, Casablanca, Tunis, Baghdad, Bahrain, Dharan, Karachi, Bombay, New Delhi, Colombo, Rangoon, Bangkok, Tokyo. Tukobana, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Manila. And you think that he would stop there, but he didn't. Uh, and other workers of airports and harbors in all Asian and African countries. I call upon the workers in the Panama Canal and other Latin American countries. I call upon the workers and the people of Australia who have demonstrated their solidarity during the National Liberation War with the, La with the Indonesian people. I call upon all, all these brave workers and peoples of Asia, Africa, and Latin America and Australia to boycott any Dutch ships and airplanes, used to transport reinforcement and military equipment to West Irian. I call upon these brothers in the event of war between Indonesia and Dutch imperialism to boycott every Dutch ship passing through their countries. So in the 1960s, so let's think about this together, and I don't have much time to pause, but um, let's think about this together. In the 1960s, there were three major approaches to the global revolution. First, it was a Soviet, Soviet peace struggle. The second, it was a Chinese peasant insurgencies. And third, there was a Ch national liberation movement, guerrilla warfare. So there were three, Soviet peace struggle, Chinese peasant insurgencies, and national liberation movement, guerrilla warfare. Do you see any of these three in this quote? In this call for circulation struggle, both the Soviet Union and China were absent. There was like no ports Soviet or Chinese port that were invoked here. Rather than Communist Party members or anti-colonial state leaders, Ibrahim Isa invoked port workers across four continents as anti-colonial agents who could stop the capitalist and imperialist flows when working together in solidarity. Isa invoked four continent workers to support the Indonesian struggle in resisting the Dutch occupation of West Papua or West Irian at that time. I don't have to, because all of us here, all, most of the people in the audience are Indonesian. I don't have to explain where West Papua is, but if I uh, talk about this elsewhere, I have to show the map of where is West Papua, West Irian. I would say, or I would argue that what we see here is the fourth form of Marxism in the 1960s called left third worldism. And in this formulation, so this is the map, when you plot every of those um, ports that were invoked um, into a map. In this formulation, Indonesia became the third world center for the global revolution if not, and not its marginal and insignificant participant. And I also need to say right away that I'm discussing about Ibrahim Isa political praxis particularly one on left third worldism aspect, which involved Isa's own view of the West Papuan question. I am aware that West Papua is a sensitive topic among Indonesian, also Indonesian left, and I'm not making claims related to West Papua itself in this talk at all. I'm talking about Ibrahim Isa. And now, uh, let me talk a bit about, so um, let me talk a bit about Ibrahim Isa biographical sketch which I think uh, some of you might be interested in, and go very quickly. So during the period focused in this talk, Isa represented Indonesia at the permanent secretariat of the Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Organization, or APSO in Cairo, Egypt from 1960 until the anti-communist government of Suharto revoked his passport in 1966. So that's the, um, so you, what you see here is, is uh, Ibrahim Isa memoir, Bui Jan Tanpa Jorajak Desi. Uh, and uh, the editor was Ahmad Mahdi and Fernanda was Bonnie Triana. 
and a little bit more about APSO. Uh, APSO, Afro Asian People's Solidarity Organization, was established in 1957 by Asian and African leftist activists who found the Bandung Conference too compromising and too focused on the political elites. So uh, APSO was more based on uh, radical politics and more based on um, uh, what they, what Indonesian would say, rakyat um, biasa, uh, ordinary people, rather than political elites like Sukarno, Nasser, and all these people, right? Um, and then here's the biographical sketch of Ibrahim Isa. Ibrahim Isa bin Karada Toksinaro Panjang, uh, as you may hear from the name, um, uh, was from a Minangkabau family. And he was born in Mester Cornelis or Jati Mekara district in Jakarta on August 20, 1930. He got his title from his Minangkabau father who bore the same name, Ibrahim Isa. And his mother, Nila Utama, came from the South Sumatran city of Mukomuko in Bengkulu province. Bengkulu province. One of his biographers claimed that the first political book Isa read was Dari Pentara ke Pentara uh, by, another, by another West Sumatran, Tan, Tan Malaka. His brother-in-law journalist and one of the founders of the first post-independence Indonesian newspaper, Berita Indonesia, S.M. Shaf, lent this book, Dari Pentara ke Pentara, to Isa. After the Dutch reoccupation war ended, Isa became a teacher at the Sulawesi Regional Association School or Chris, Kabakian Rakyat Indonesia Sulawesi, in Jakarta, and at the same time, the Chris Foundation's general secretary. It was here that Isa briefly overlapped with the future Indonesian president, Abdul Rahman Wahid of Gusdur, who remember and looked for the exiled Isa in the Netherlands in one of his state trips. As an educator activist with firsthand knowledge of youth struggles, Isa was selected by the Indonesian Peace Committee, or Komite Perdamaian Indonesia, KPI in August 1952 to attend the World Federation of Democratic Youth Preparatory Meeting in Copenhagen, Denmark. After this internationalist debut, Isa became more involved with the Indonesian Peace Committee as its executive. He had no records of formal affiliation with any Indonesian political parties, even as he was very close to some key communist figures like the PKI's vice chairman, Nyoto. Because of his association with the Peace Committee, which worked closely with the leftist, within the leftist Afro-Asian activist movement who founded APSO, Isa was chosen as the Indonesian representative to APSO. In this way, Isa represents a left third worldist strand of the Indonesian radicalism who sides with the Indonesian Communist Party but does not become its party member. Isa was not alone as a left third worldist. Other left third worldist figures that I'm able to track includes the Peace Committee's Women's Department Head, Utami Surya Dama, and the Chair of Afro-Asian Journalist Association, Jawoto. And after Isa's passport, passport was revoked in 1966, Isa and his family fled to the PRC, China, and then the Netherlands in 1956. He passed away in the Netherlands six years ago in 2016. So uh, let's get back to uh, left third worldism. Isa, thought of his mission in Cairo as the conjoining of the national campaign to liberate West Papua with larger Afro-Asian anti-colonial struggles for independence. In fact, Isa took some time to research on effective frame to link the West Papuan question with Arab-Asian struggles while he was on duty in Cairo. So in the picture, you already see Isa discussing with African di diplomats about the Indonesian liberation of West Papua and Cairo. Um, the results of his research culminated in Isa's 12 page long speech delivered on the night of January 8, 1962. And this picture is Isa presenting the speech on the West Papuan liberation at the AFSO gathering in Cairo in 1962. Immediately at the speech title here, the liberation of West Irian and imperialist maneuvers in the Middle East, Isa already highlighted the connection between West Papuan liberation and Arab Asian anti colonial struggles in the Middle East. The term maneuvers captured the sense of logistical operations fundamental to the trans oceanic kind of imperialism that Isa investigated. And let's get into the text. I, I'm just going to highlight the most important aspect of the text that I think is worth um, uh, uh, analyzing together. About a quarter of the speech, Isa quoted Absol Solidarity's statement on West Papua, 
released a month earlier, presumably written by Isa himself to support his left third worldist analysis of capitalism and imperialism. Again, I'm highlighting this to show you the unique aspect or unique dimension of left third worldism, which is what? Which is the connection or the connected analysis of capitalism and imperialism as an intertwined um, system, rather than seeing capitalism as a separate system and imperialism as a separate system. Left third worldism connects imperialism with capitalism. That's a key point. So the quote, the, the statement is, at the present moment, the Dutch colonialists strongly supported by the US and other imperialists are concentrating their efforts to liquidate physically the national liberation movement in West Irian and further to establish a puppet state of the so-called state of Papua. At the same time, Dutch military reinforcement is flowing to West Irian. Experience repeatedly shows that the colonialists and imperialists will never voluntarily give up their colonies and exploitation. They will not understand the aspiration of the people to be free unless they are forced to do so. So what does this statement tell us? This absolute quotation characterized imperialism as structurally violent and motivated by power and profit. So we already see that imperialism is motivated by power and profit. What does that mean? Imperialism and capitalism are intertwined. The Dutch US France Imperial Alliance aimed to physically liquidate the national liberation in West Syria. They call for military reinforcement, violent. They would not voluntarily give up their colonies and exploitation. Again, the connection between imperialism and capitalism. They needed to be driven out by force. Let's continue with the quotation. The liberation of this territory from imperialist yoke will eliminate another hotbed of war and thus promote peace and security in this area. The permanent secretariat calls, especially upon the people and the workers in the harbors and aerodromes of Asian African countries to boycott any Dutch ship and airplane used to transport troops, reinforcement and military equipment to West Irian. Understanding that Dutch imperialist existence in West Papua only triggered war and threatened peace. What does this passage, what does this passage tells us? This passage linked the liberation from imperialism in one world region to an elimination of one war possibility, bringing the world one micro step closer to a specific conception of peace. And what is this specific conception of peace? It's not the peace that endorsed a coexistence of imperialist and cap capitalist aggressor and their potential victims. This specific conception of peace aim to abolish the capitalist and imperialist system that caused aggression in the first place so that aggression would no longer be an issue at all. It's a very, very substantive account of peace. It's not a co peaceful coexistence, but it's a peace that there is no imperialist capitalist aggression um, to be made possible at all. It's a substantive, very substantive conception of peace. This absolute solidarity statement also called on Afro-Asian peoples and workers for a circulation struggle, just like the quote that I have referred to early on in this presentation. Let me slow down to explain what I mean by circulation struggles, which were here manifested through a boycott from, a boycott form. Geography of Indonesia as an archipelagic colony and the Netherlands as a seafaring empire meant that the ocean was their primary economic and military contact zone. This in turn necessitated the ocean along with all the logistical operations and transportation networks to be sites of anti-colonial subversion and colonial counterinsurgency. I follow scholars like Deborah Cohen and Joshua Clover to call this transoceanic collision circulation struggles. Circulation struggles register acts of resistance aiming to disrupt the coordinated yet overstretched and vulnerable circuits of imperialist network infrastructure and capitalist supply chain, specifically at their concentrated key site or choke points. So that's what I mean by circulation struggles. And to situate the explanation of circulation struggles in the context of American neocolonialism, I'm referring to another text that I consider to be a left third world this manifesto the CCP's 1965 People's War. The People's War's text analyzed expansive US imperialism as quote, overreaching itself, and quote, dispersing its strength with its rear so far away and its supply line so long. So you already see, again, like this connection between logistical infrastructure, US imperialism, and supply lines with in, which indicate 
the, again, interconnection between imperialism and capitalism. In this sense, People's War understood US imperialism as a surreality of overreached supply lines. Similar to other leftist macro analyses of global imperialism and capitalism that share the language of network circulation and link. And what are those macro analytics of the conjoined capitalist imperialist system that we are familiar with? So there are, um, of course, here uh, the people war see reality. And there's also the language of Lenin to Trotsky, weakest link. There are also language of Samir Amin's delinking and language of Jasper Burns' counter, counter logistics. Because US imperialism was always overstretched and vulnerable, people wars, people's war contended that waging multiple coordinated wars on it at different key sites would significantly weaken and split up this imperialist whole. People's war solution of multiple wars, Lenin and Trotsky's weakest link, Amin's delinking, and Abso and Isa's boycotting. So we are getting back to Isa's boycotting, which is related to left third worldism all operate on the same dialectical logic. And what is that same dialectical logic? It is striking the uneven imperialist capitalist system that appears invincible at its vulnerable joints. What does this mean? Conceiving US capitalist empire as a giant uniform structure may deceive one into thinking that it is invincible, right? If we think of something as a monolith, it's invincible, you cannot strike it down. But if you understand it as a serially, as a link, it allows one to strike this link apart at the vulnerable joint. So that's sort of like the strat oppositional strategy and logic that's coming out of the left third world is oppositional strategy. Isa, Ibrahim Isa, issue an ultimatum for circulation struggles after his citation of the Absol Solidarity Statement. In the quote that we already read together earlier, he single-handedly maxed out every single note in the violent imperialist cartographies where Asian, African, Latin American, and Australian workers could disrupt the Dutch US imperialist lifeline and capitalist flow in support of the West Papuan liberation. So here, I'm going to stop uh, for this section. Um, but the main takeaway here about left federalism and how Indonesia was the center of this left federalism was it was sort of a call for boycotting of Dutch ship on the question of um, the liberation of West Papua. And um, the main takeaway of left third world this analysis is that it always link the imperialist system with a capitalist system. So then you start to see, so there was one of the questions in the poster talking about um, uh, what is the apa, uh, relevancy katasan progressive uh, internationalist theory terhadap Indonesia dan dunia. So to answer that question very succinctly is exactly this Ibrahim Isa understanding of left third worldism and his oppositional strategy of circulation struggle. Okay, and moving on to my last section of this talk, which is about minor communist internationalism. And you would see that this part is least polished because it's my first time ever after finishing the dissertation to present on this. The previous section, I have been presenting it a few times. So I, I'm very like fluent on my, pre, on my previous section. On this section, it's going to be very new. So um, for all of you who are expecting me to say new stuff, uh, this is where it is. So uh, bear with me. So on the question of minor communist internationalism, what is it? Uh, I would define it as an autocritical praxis of the non-dominant communist parties. What do I mean by non-dominant communist countries? It is any dominant, it is any communist country that is not Soviet Union and China. So it is an autocritical practice of non-dominant communist parties in questioning or contesting Soviet big country Calvinism, consisting of Stalinist dogmatism and Khrushchevian revisionism. So it's a contestation of again Soviet big country Chauvinism. And uh, what is their solution to Soviet big country chauvinism? Their solutions are uh, to practice economic self-reliance. So then they don't have to be dependent on the Soviet financial aid and also having ideological independence. So again, they don't have to follow the Soviet commandist, commandist hierarchy within the context of horizontal communist fraternity. fraternity. And why is this horizontal? Because it's not 
a vertical and hierarchical system. What minor communist internationalism actually wants is the sort of equal and mutual cooperative uh, uh, kind of uh, inter-communist connection between different communist parties. It's not like Soviet country, Soviet Union and China at the top and some other like uh, minor communist party at the bottom. They were suggesting what I would, what I would term uh, decolonization of communism from within. They want the Soviet Union, the CCP, Chinese Communist Party in the same level as other minor communist parties. So this is what this gesture is what I kind of see as a decolonization of communism from within. So these are the main key uh, characteristics of minor communist internationalism. And uh, I will give you uh, more detail about this. So now we shift to the PKI. I suggest that the starting point for the PKI to think about a novel, novel form of solidarity was when the Soviet Union criticized the Albanian Worker Party in the 22nd Soviet Party Congress in 1961. And after the Soviet Union condemned the Albanian Workers Party in that uh, 22nd Congress, I did responded in this way in December 1961 after two months. So I did responded was, I did response was, the problem is not one of autonomy, but of freedom and equal rights of all communist parties. We do not live in a kingdom or a republic of communist parties in which there is a strong pressure from the central government. Therefore, the question of autonomy does not arise. So this is Ida's response. So the question for us is, what should we make of this? Because we are so used to think about any, anything related to independence would be autonomy. But I did say it was not autonomy. Uh, it was something else. So what was that something else about freedom and equal rights of all communist parties? I propose that we read this statement as a call for, and this is my term, horizontal communist fraternity. So this is the X. This is the alternative to the Soviet big country communism. There's a, there's a solution. This is X is a solution to uh, communist Soviet uh, commandism which is a horizontal communist fraternity. Note that fraternity refers to comradeship and collectivity rather than individual autonomy or the other extreme, holy centrism. This is not individual autonomy. This is not multiple centers. It is treating everyone in the same horizontal communist fraternity where everyone has equal rights within the international communist uh, milieu. Again, it's not individual autonomy. It's also not multiple cent centers, not polycentrism. So I think this is very interesting um, as the PKI's way to decolonize communism from within. Um, and one main question of the PKI at that time was the question of imperialism, which was downplayed by Khrushchev revisionism. How does the peripheral communist party in a non-dominant position like the PKI deal with the ongoing imperialist structure and colonialism. So what was the question with Khrushchev revisionism? So if you are familiar a bit with the idea of revisionism, was that Khrushchev was saying that, oh, uh, imperialism is somewhat over. Uh, we do not have to deal with the question of imperialism, imperialism anymore. And what is the sort of material manifestation of it is that, oh, we can cooperate with the US in, um, in the context of um, uh, peaceful coexistence. And that is how we sort of can put a blind eye on US neo-imperialism elsewhere. So that's the problem of Khrushchev revisionism. The problem of Khrushchev revisionism is that it doesn't care or it downplay the question of imperialism. And that's why it's a problem for the PKI. Because for PKI, what did it see? As you can already see from the previous section that there was still ongoing American military bases elsewhere. There's still a continuation of American colonialism elsewhere. There's still a trans-imperialist cooperation between the US and other uh, erstwhile colonial countries. Let's say the Netherlands, let's say France, let's say uh, uh, the Brits in recolonizing Asia, Africa, and Latin America. When the PKI saw this ongoing continuing colonialism, it also cannot work within 
the framework of Khrushchev revisionism as well. So therefore imperialism is always, always a big question for PKI. And that again would link back to my um, explanation earlier, why question of internationalism and peripherality is so important. PKI is just not interested in analyzing Indonesia. The PKI was also interested in analyzing a shared material condition linking Indonesia, um, linking Indonesia with other parts of the world. The question of imperialism is not about imperialism in Indonesia, but also imperialism in Latin America, in Asia, in other parts of Asia and Latin America. So this to go back to my original point that why internationalism and left, oh, sorry, left internationalism and peripherality are so important here. So the PKI needed to find allies that both opposed American neocolonialism and Soviet big country Calvinism. Soviet big country Calvinism was complex because it was consisted of both Khrushchev revisionism that downplayed the imperialist question and Stalin's legacy of centralized commandism. I think the process that captured what the PKI did with the Soviet big country Calvinism and revisionism is the decolonization of international communism from within. And here is what uh, I did uh, outline for his, what I would call the colonial approach to communism. We could read this together. It is precisely the one which is prepared to accept the opinions of other parties. After having considered them as a whole, and after these opinions have been welded with the creative abilities and skills of the proletariat of that country itself, Indonesian communists listen to the opinions of fraternal parties with open hearts and open minds and are prepared to accept them if they conform to the requirements of the Indonesian revolution and if they lead to strengthen the Indonesian communist movement. These colonial stands, and what were these decolonial stands? They were like active listening, right? And also listening with open hearts and open minds. This decolonial stance is to emphasize not hierarchical communism, but horizontal communist fraternity. And most, interest, most interestingly, the PKI returned to Lenin to critique Stalin's dogmatism and Khrushchev revisionism. Uh, first of all, before getting to that point, we need to establish that for the PKI, the issue of socialism or anti-capitalism and anti-imperialism are tightly interconnected, just like the left third worldist analytics. In the 1963 Politburo report, I did state it, that the proletariat of the whole, we, we can read this together, the proletariat of the whole world should joyfully welcome the ever searching forward and brightening revolutionary situation in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. They should enthusiastically hail the fact that these three continents have become the arena of the most principal contradiction in the world, contradiction between the oppressed nations and imperialism. Notice the identification of the proletariat of the whole world with the oppressed nations, which means the interconnected understanding of socialism and anti-imperialism. And then the PKI referred to Lenin from the National Liberation Movement in the East is the name of the text. Then stated, between the victory, victory of socialism in one country and the victory of the World Socialist Revolution, there is an inseparable connection. The socialist revolution that has already been victorious in one country must not be turned into a self-contained entity and cut off from the rest it must be turned into an assistant or means in order to speed up the victories of revolution in other countries. What does this mean? This is a very, very important quote for me. Not only did I did critique Stalin's socialism in one country policy and Khrushchev revisionism that ignore ongoing imperialism. He also demonstrated the PKI independent attitude in making sense of global communism by neither citing the living Chinese or Soviet communist leader. There were so many things happening in this quote that I think if we have more time, we can unpack. So here, what I would, what I would say is that I did refer to another dead Soviet figure, which is Lenin, in order to critique two Soviet leaders, which was Stalin and Khrushchev. How neat is that? So there are, there were three Soviet, lead, Soviet thinkers here, Lenin, Khrushchev, Stalin, and Khrushchev. I did went back to Lenin to use the Soviet Marxist um, predecessor to critique Stalin's 
idea of socialism in one country, and also to critique Khrushchev, revisionist ignorance of ongoing imperialism. It's shooting uh, two birds with one stone. And I think there's a very, very important quote. Um, okay, moving on. I argue that the novel constellation of minor communist internationalism coordinated by the PKI was consisted of three major members serving three different dimensions, North Kalimantan and Malaya for a new political formation, North Korea for economic self-reliance and Albania for global anti-revisionist ideology. We don't have much time left. We don't have uh, much time left. So uh, I'm going to focus only on North Korea and Albania and then I'm going to end. So this is uh, an image of I did with uh, Kim Il-sung in 1963. Uh, about North Korea, I did mention after returning from his trip to five socialist countries in 1963, that it is North Korea that must be the example of how socialism ought to be built. It was curious that why did I did choose North Korea rather than the Soviet Union or China? I did praise North Korea for its self-reliant economic policy called Juche that did not depend on Soviet financial aids. Juche enacted a double emancipatory process. First was a delinking from the Soviet-led internationalist division of labor. Second, concern a decolonization from communist hierarchy towards cooperation based on equality and mutual benefit. Therefore, my answer to that question of why did I did choose North Korea rather than the Soviet Union or China was that I did saw Juche as a praxis of minor communist internationalism. As also, I did imply that Juche policy rather than a Soviet or Chinese rhetoric inspired him to coin the term Banteng spirit or Smangat Banteng to encourage Indonesians to be economically independent. So here we already see that economic self-reliance is a very, very important ethos for Aidit uh, in his mind when he is forming this minor communist internationalist praxis. Uh, uh, internationalist formation. And then, so that's the North Korean part. We get to uh, Albania. On Albania, the PKI highlighted the Albanian resistance against both imperialist and modern revisionists. So here's the quote. When I did send um, one of the um, one of the PKI member to uh, the Albanian uh, Worker Party Congress in 1964. And this is the quote. But the heroic Albanian people who cannot be intimidated by the imperialists and the modern revisionists have united more closely around the party of labor of Albania and work hard with a spirit of self-reliance to overcome all obstacles and difficulties towards the ultimate goal. So uh, what are some of the lessons we can derive from this quote? Here, the PKI saw the extricable connection between imperialism and revisionism just like how we have already discussed earlier about Khrushchev revisionism as another manifestation of imperialism. We also see the notion of self-reliance, so emblematic of minor communist internationalism in this statement. Even as the relationship between the PKI and the Albanian Worker Party was brief, it started only in 1964. So it, it lasted only two years when PKI was still an operational party. Um, this relationship actually lasted after the anti-communist genocide in 1956. I'm sorry, 1965-1966. Albania, interestingly, was among the first country that announced its solidarity with the Indonesian communists. And I would say this is a minor communist internationalist uh, praxis between Albania, North Korea, and Indonesia. In this solidarity statement, Enver Hoxha, who was the chairman of the Albanian Workers' Party, emphasized the point that I did had consistently made about horizontal from this fraternity. So um, in this document, when uh, Enver Hoxha was actually analyzing what went wrong with the Indonesian Communist Party, he was stating this. While strictly rep respecting the independence of every party in determining its own line policy, the Marxist Leninists must at the same time work out a common line and a common stand on the most fundamental issues especially in regard to the struggle against imperialism and the struggle to defend the purity of Marxism-Leninism for modern revisionism. So what was Hoxha saying here was that there wasn't enough cooperation between minor communist countries because the official Khrushchev revisionist line was wrong and fucked up. 
That's why Indonesian Communist Party was lost to, you know, the uh, the and the revisionist imperialist forces, namely the U.S., also namely the domestic military forces, because, um, because international communism needed more cooperation among minor minor communist parties to come up with um, a policy that really corresponds to their peripheral condition which was under the oppression under the anti, anti, under the imperialist oppression right so that is what was the core of uh, of this statement we see once again the decolonial practices of minor communist internationalism here that contested big country Calvinism and enacted ideological independence. So let me wrap up. I know that I'm going a little bit over time, actually 20 minutes over time, but okay, let me wrap up. My main two analytics here are hold back. my main two analytics here are left internationalism and peripherality. I take the two as a pair of subjective and objective conditions for a global revolution against capitalist totality. I hope this is clearer now after I'm presenting left third worldism and minor communist internationalism. Internationalism is an empowering praxis of a cooperation that connects Indonesian Marxism to other contemporaneous leftist struggles against capitalism, imperialism, and racism. So what were the concrete examples of internationalism that I just presented? In left third worldism, it support workers from four continents. And in the minor communist internationalism, it was Indonesia, North Korea, and Albania coming, forming an anti-revisionist um, circuit against um, Soviet big country Calvinism. So that internationalism. And then peripherality. Peripherality manifests a shared material condition between Indonesia and countries in the periphery of global capitalism that has otherwise been kept separate by the capitalist and imperialist oppressors. So we already saw in left third worldism, what was kept separate? So there were already like uh, many manifestations of American neocolonialism, not just in West Papua, not just Indonesia, but also in many of the poor cities, many of the ports, airports and seaports around the world in the sixties manifested through the American military bases, but those were kept separate, right? That we don't actually usually see, oh, what is the connection? neo-colonial connection between Indonesia, West Papua, and maybe India, maybe Japan, maybe South Korea, maybe Taiwan. So those are the peripheral material condition that I'm trying to show that there were already Indonesian thinkers that were already thinking in this way, seeing the peripheral, shared peripheral condition between Indonesia, West Papua, or whatsoever, and elsewhere. And that's why Ibrahim Isa came up with this idea this is my term, but came up with left third world this analysis of the world. And then the second example was um, for peripherality between what, what is the peripheral condition between Indonesia, North Korea, and Albania. Three nations just emerged out of the war of liberation. The Dutch, uh, Indonesian from the Dutch, North Korea from the Japanese, Albania from the Yugoslav. So they just emerged out of liberation war. And they, they were peripheral to big communist countries. North Korea were, was peripheral to the uh, People's Republic of China. Albania was peripheral to the Soviet Union. And Indonesia, as I was saying earlier, was peripheral to everything, to the Soviet Union, to China. And that is why, because it was so peripheral to everything, I think that was in Aidit's mind uh, to posit Indonesia as the center of minor communist internationalism. So I think that is um, the conclusion of my talk today. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, um, sorry, sorry there. My connection just suddenly froze, but um, I think we have met um, some 
um, a very insightful conclusion from Mr. Fipi because as he was saying, he was, well, he, we, um, we were unpacking a lot of information there. And so because of the time as well, as mentioned before, we are already past um, 20 minutes after the, yeah, after the, um, maybe the present, the pass of any question regarding the topic today, or maybe you want to raise their um, raise hand, use the raise hand method in Zoom, uh, it would be more than acceptable. Okay, I see two hands here. Maybe, um, maybe first to Mrs. Ita Fatiana here, if you'd like to unmute. Ya, uh, terima kasih. Terima kasih, Titi. Uh, saya jangan dipanggil Mrs. ya. Saya Ita, Ita saja. Saya orang Indonesia. <laughs> saya berbahasa Indonesia ya, Titi ya, supaya lebih enak karena uh, apa lebih nyaman saya untuk mengungkapkan apa uh, persoalan yang ingin saya sampaikan pad, pada Titi. Kebetulan bulan Mei saya dua minggu meneliti tentang arsip-arsip gerakan Afro Asia di uh, Belanda dan uh, apa uh, fokus saya adalah pada gerakan internasionalisme uh, gerakan perempuan internasional internasionalisme dan ketika saya membaca seluruh arsip di IISH saya menemukan uh, apa tulisan-tulisan uh, atau jurnal khususnya tentang the call dan versusnya yaitu lotus ya. Nah dalam penjelasan Titi tadi karena Titi menjelaskan tentang komunisme internasional, saya ingin memberikan satu penemuan saya yang pertama adalah tentang kebudayaan karena di dalam gerakan internasionalisme persoalan kebudayaan atau terlibatnya Indonesia di dalam apa gerakan internasionalisme sangat penting. Tentu Abso itu sangat luar biasa ya. Tetapi kan tidak hanya Abso, tetapi juga ada di Konakri yaitu tentang di, apa juris ya kantor juris yang diwakili oleh Pak Wianto SH. Sementara di apa di di mana di di Kolombo untuk Afro Asia Writers Bureau itu ada Hersri dan ada apa sastrawan Rifai Apin. Nah di dalam di dalam bacaan bacaan arsip dari The Call itu tentu saya berpikiran bahwa apa yang dikatakan Titi tadi tentang Indonesian apa Center of the Minor komunisme uh, internasional itu menjadi sangat penting karena di dalam The Call dan di sana tulisan-tulisannya Rifai Apin dan Hersri banyak sekali bagaimana lekra atau kebudayaan atau uh, apa, apa pemikiran kebudayaan uh, 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 pembebasan nasional dan melawan kolon, uh, neokolonialisme itu difokuskan pada negara-negara Afrika ya negara-negara Afrika dan banyak sekali saya mendapatkan tulisan-tulisan dari The Call tentang itu tentunya ini bagian dari bagaimana komunisme Indonesia merancang atau me, 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 membuat sebuah apa gerakan untuk mempengaruhi pemikiran-pemikiran di apa gerakan pembebasan nasional di Afrika itu satu saya menemukan banyak di dalam bahkan Hersri menulis tentang apa Mosambik ya menulis tentang Mosambik juga menulis tentang Kamboja dan juga Rifai Apin nah artinya the call sendiri artinya Afro Asia ini menjadi menjadi suara dari gerakan internasional komunisme Nah, yang kedua yang saya kira penting bahwa di dalam internasionalisme komunisme yaitu perempuan. Dan saya menemukan satu buku kecil ini yang menarik sekali waktu di Belanda yaitu tentang konferensi anti-imperialisme yang digagas oleh Gerwan, yaitu bagaimana konferensi Asia Afrika harus tetap mengusung tentang pemikiran atau gerakan tentang anti-imperialisme. Dan kemudian ada apa satu konferensi yang menurut saya penting sekali 
yaitu dokumen yang yaitu konferensi di konferensi Afro Asia Women's Conference di Kairo. Ibrahim Asia ada, Francisca Fangide, Sugiyarti Seswadi, semua ada. Nah, itu ada pada tahun 61, tetapi sebetulnya sebelumnya tahun 58 dan kemudian tahun 49 itu ada di Beijing. Nah, konferensi Beijing perempuan ini untuk internasionalisme, komunisme, marxisme ini di sinilah terjadi perdebatan yang sangat kuat. Bagaimana jalan dari gerakan gerakan internasional komunisme yang perempuan itu dirumuskan. Nanti kemudian ada dalam Women International Development eh, apa, eh, Democratic Forum, Cup Democratic Forum pecah menjadi dua untuk pandangan-pandangan ini. Nah, saya kira ini sangat penting untuk dikemukakan titik karena bagaimanapun perempuan dan kebudayaan gerakan Indonesia dalam percaturan kebudayaan anti anti apa dalam internasional komunisme itu juga sangat penting untuk disampaikan. Nah, Uh, itu yang saya temukan selama saya satu bulan di Belanda kemarin bulan Mei dan dokumen-dokumen itu menjadi sangat penting ya uh, saya kira bahwa Indonesia sangat pen, apa, berperanan penting di dalam gerakan terutama perempuan di sini ada Francisca Fangide, Setiati Surasto bahkan Setiati Surasto dikirim ke Albania untuk berperang mengangkat senjata melawan Prancis nah itu kan menarik ya untuk Bagaimana perempuan menjadi bagian dari gerakan internasional komunisme? Itu yang ingin saya tambahkan, Titi. Terima kasih, Titi. Saya pakai bahasa Indonesia, ya, Ti. Ya, oke, oke, maybe thank you very much, Bu. Um, uh, ya, yeah. so maybe if Mr. Titi want to um, respond, if you have any responses. Actually, um, maaf ya kalau saya uh, apa bercawat dalam bahasa Inggris ya karena kalau bahasa Indonesia saya agak sedikit apa rasti dan tidak lancar dan uh, sekarang apa -apa. Oh, um, yang ini ya yang Bu Ita tadi um, uh, 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 bilang itu sangat menarik saya juga apa menemukan beberapa uh, uh, dokumen dokumen tentang wanita AA Afris, uh, Asia Afrika yang ini ya mungkin yang di Uh, yang 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 terjadi di Kairo ya yang uh, Bu Ita bilang tadi. Iya. Yeah, yeah. uh, I actually have been really trying to find uh, more uh, uh, archive about um, this area and I could not really find that much. So I think like the only person in the world that would know <laughs> about uh, conference conference uh, wanita uh, anti imperialism uh, the konteksnya Asia Afrika itu Bu Ita. So I, I, think, I think I have to like uh, put you more uh, on this because there are also some other, um, so here, what it say was that, okay, here yang um, uh, partisipannya adalah ini. Um, Francisca Fangide, ya. Yeah. Francisca Fangide, Di Hajono, Arifin Sidajo, Yeah, so I was really interested in Iwana Priyono because I think she was also a lawyer. But yeah. I can't really find uh, much more uh, information about uh, all of them at all. So um, I remember Francisca Fankide uh, because yeah. uh, you were really um, uh, giving me lots of uh, guidance uh, to look mm -hmm. into her archive and also Setiati Surasto. But yeah. then for, uh, for the rest, I actually have no clue of where to find more information about them. <laughs> Okay, don't worry, don't worry, Tati. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I just just wanting to say that I'm very, very interested in this question, and I really yeah. wish that I, I I could do more on it. Yeah, actually, Iwana Priyono is the wife of the Mr. Priyono, is the one of the uh, prime uh, minister of education, Indonesian minister of education, and she's very active in the uh, Afro Asia movement, and and unfortunately that the history did not. Uh, acknowledge her very much on that. Yeah. I also think I have another very cool picture to um, to show you, but uh, let's see if I could find it. Yeah, another person that I'm very interested in that I could not really find much um, information about is um, uh, Bu. Utami. Ya, Bu Utami. Ya. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Miss Rihanna. Yes. So uh, very involved in Afro Asian uh, film festival yes. and also the um uh the feminist um yeah. head of the uh peace committee uh, Indonesian peace committee and yeah. I I really really interested uh in yeah. uh activism of uh Bu um Utami. Yeah. Yeah. She actually she wrote a, a small book on the kami kami cinta damai tapi lebih cinta kemerdekaan right. and yeah and it's very good uh, writing on that yeah I also think there's also an um, affiliation with um, I also haven't found a lot of information about her but her name is Ratu Amina Hidayat yeah yeah she, also. Is, she is also an artist she is also a painter yeah mm -hmm. yeah yes. So, okay. So, okay. So. Thank you. Okay. We will discuss it after this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Bu. I'm sorry I called you, Mrs. It's yeah. It's part of the etiquette. So maybe um for the second question, I see from Mr. or Mrs. Uh, Begisme. Maybe if you would allow yourself to be unmuted or maybe turn turn on your camera. Oke, okay, uh, terima kasih, Mas. Tapi saya masih agak bingung, terutama ketika Anda menyebutkan pemikiran Aidit ya sebagai peripheral Marxis. Mohon maaf kalau istilahnya salah. Uh, yang intinya Anda sebutkan uh, tidak tanki ya dalam istilah Anda tanki komunis gitu ya, tidak menginduk kepada Soviet pada saat itu. Padahal sejauh yang saya tahu ketika pasca tahun 48 ketika PKI ingin membangun kembali partainya, PKI waktu itu walaupun masih di bawah Tan Lingji misalnya sangat mengandalkan Soviet untuk uh, menyempurnakan rencana mereka. gitu. Uh, mereka berkirim surat nanti uh, Stalin yang mengakses suratnya, rencana-rencananya. Begitu pula ketika generasi Aidit menyingkirkan generasi Tan Lingji dalam megang partai bahkan sampai tahun 53 pun rencana-rencana PKI masih harus dievaluasi oleh Stalin. Tidak itu dalam surat-surat di tahun 53 ya. Itu dan di edit atas nama PKI meminta uh, evaluasi dari Stalin gitu. Dan bahkan kalau kita lihat misalnya surat Stalin kepada edit itu surat terakhir kalau nggak salah sebelum dia meninggal tanggal 16 Februari tahun 53 dan pidato edit yang menuju Indonesia baru di beberapa bulan kemudian itu ada beberapa poin yang bahkan dikutip oleh edit secara verbatim gitu. Saya tidak bisa membayangkan bagaimana independennya eh, ketika rencana partai saja harus diakses oleh Soviet. Gitu. Tadi Anda juga menyebutkan kritik Aidit kepada PKUS, ya, Partai Komunis Uni Soviet, eh, tentang Albania gitu ya, eh, tahun 61. Saya pikir eh, kalau dilihat konteksnya itu adalah masa ketika PKI sudah pecah kongsi dengan Soviet gitu, karena revisi Indonesia Khrushchev gitu kan yang banyak dikritik oleh Aidit, tapi juga kita tidak bisa menafikan uh, saya atau saya setidaknya belum menemukan contoh kritik Aidit kepada Partai Komunis Cina gitu. Harusnya kan berimbang nih ketika kita ingin menyebutkan tadi kan ada menyebutkan PKI ingin mer, tidak menginduk kepada Soviet ataupun Cina, tapi yang saya lihat hanya kritik kepada Soviet saja, sedangkan kepada Cina tidak ada. Bahkan kalau kita baca tulisan Tao Nuzu di jurnal Cordell itu kan Aidit bahkan masih memberitahu mau tentang rencana 30 September itu artinya saya tidak melihat bahwa ada independensi Aidit di situ itu itu, itu saja sih kebingungan saya terima kasih ya uh, maaf juga kalau saya membahas dalam bahasa Inggris ya um, so yeah, so I I think this is a very um, interesting question because for me um, I think it's open to further debate because um, I have another uh, section that I haven't um, uh, discussed with many of you here, was also the PKI's, I did theoretical interest in returning to Lenin, um, specifically, rather than quoting Stalin wholesale. So I, so I think for me, um, it could be very difficult to look at the, um, what like the uh, official practice of Aidit Pekka in early 50s um, to really see that what kind of theoretical 
innovation. So I, I think, okay, so I think maybe it could be a question of perspective because for me, I always think that, okay, what is the way to differentiate Indonesian Marxism in the 50s and 60s uh, from, let's say, looking at it as just a post-colonial Stalinism. So I think that's sort of like my, my, my starting point. Like what distinguished PKI from any other um, uh, existing communist party? So if we actually look at uh, the Indonesian Communist Party as not doing anything theoretical, do anything situational and specific at all, then we would make an argument that it's just a mere copy of Stalin Indonesian context, right? And I think that's the kind of argument, okay, one, one could make that, oh, like uh, the PKI is post-colonial Stalinism. That's an argument that one could make. But for me, I think it doesn't really um, show what is the theoretical contribution of the Indonesian Communist Party, perhaps like to the larger um, discussion of international communist, uh, international communism in the 60s. So yes, I, I, I think, this might be a topic of another talk, but what I would say very quickly that I could think of right now is that if we think about um, okay, uh, okay, I don't think I have a good, I don't have a good, I don't have a good example right now. But I think like if we we look at any of I did work at all, um, there's always and it's also unsighted. This is also something very difficult in doing intellectual history of Southeast Asia generally, because writing um, in the 20th century, early 20th century to like middle 20th century, don't actually do citation as much. But we one see when one, when I did making some kind of claim that might sound very familiar to um, a kind of Stalinist claim, there's always some small caveat that he was also looking at uh, Mao's text or Mao, Mao Zedong's writings or Lenin's writing in order to come up with, oh, like we, we are saying that, but we also don't mean that completely. There's always something else that uh, I did was also playing when he was coming up with like his theoretical, uh, when in his theoretical work. So, um, so yeah, so I, I think I would just answer this by saying that my primary, uh, perhaps my, my own theoretical bias, bias uh, in studying PKI at first is um, to look at theoretical innovation that prevent us to characterize the PKI as only post-colonial Stalinism. And when I start from that, I start to look at, oh, so what were some of their other intellectual sources, whether they come from Lenin, whether they come from Gramsci, whether they come from Mao, to look at like, what are the um, constellation, theoretical constellation of these um, thinker in order for ID to come up with some kind of statement that we see that's so similar to the um, to the Stalinist statement. Yeah, so I hope that answered the uh, that answered the question. Okay, Bung Titi, terima kasih. Yeah, sama sama. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think that's a very interesting note because in understanding toward the left world worldism and of course understanding in a sense, how peripheral is that the movement of well, IDTPKI during the time really shows the perspective that can be seen from Mr. Titi as well, as he explains that there's a lot of caveat, there's a lot of extra notes. Um, so maybe for the, um, for the final question, I see, um, um, I see someone here from uh, Mr. Habi Sarif. Uh, maybe if um, Mr. Titi, you want to um, respond directly. So the question is, um, is the non-aligned movement that formed during uh, Sukarno's era part of uh, left third worldism? Maybe um, what he's referring is from the the non-block, the Gerakan non-block. Maybe you could explain more a little about that? Yeah, so uh, I understand the question. So uh, I think this, this is a very interesting question too. And I think like this is a question that um, among the uh, leftist internationalists ourselves, uh, maybe I could refer to me as one of them, ourselves, um, we sort of still somewhat, for me, I feel like there's some kind of um, a, 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 a theoretical uh, 
fussiness uh, when one talk about third worldism. Like for me, third worldism is not automatically leftist. Uh, third worldism is, as, as a term, is a neutral term. There is left third worldism, there is right third worldism, and there's also liberal or centrist third worldism. And then for me, I see, okay, so what is a kind of right third worldism you could see of like some kind of um, anti-communist circuit um, in Asia, those that, you know, I, I think recently um, in Indonesia, there should be a lot of discussion about CCF um, after the publication of, um, so, uh, Wijaya Herlambang's book about CCF, which is the cultural wing of CIA, and then talk about Yayasan Obor uh, and uh, Encounter Magazine. I see Bowman here, so he's also should know like the context in the Philippines, the Encounter Magazine um, in the Philippines, that these are the part of right third worldism of the anti communist network coordinated by CIA and also. Um, the uh, uh, national intellect intellectuals in different nations. So that is, for me, that is right third worldism. And then a liberal or centrist third worldism, there was something like Bandung or uh, non-aligned movement, NAM, because um, it's not talking as much about revolution. It's talking more about the reform of the uh, colonized countries. Um, and what does reform mean? Actually, it doesn't talk much about the um, transformation or an abolition of the capitalist system, but rather how to make it better. So uh, we can distribute wealth better, we can have better condition for workers, but we weren't talking about um, uh, what, like uh, the self-governance of worker, right? That's not something that Sukarno is uh, interested in. So for me, Bandung and uh, non-aligned movement NAM, Particularly, NAM is actually like more towards the right. Uh, so, so Bandungism, all these things, is liberal or centrist third worldism for me. And left third worldism is what I just presented. That is that has been represented by APSO, by Tri Continental Conference in 1966, um, and also what Ibrahim Isa or Francisca Funkide has been uh, have been um, uh, 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 enacting throughout their life of what. Uh, Hershey Setiawan has been working on throughout their life. So those are kind of left third worldism. So I'm making a distinction between right centrist or liberal and left third worldism here. Okay, um, so for Mr. Habi, maybe that answer your question. Um, so, yeah, do, do, do. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Habib Sharif. Uh, maybe so, uh, due to time constraint, uh, maybe we could uh, try to recap on our discussion. So, first, uh, we have our very interesting and very excellent materials from Mr. Titi explaining about the um, well, the different blocks and how we analyze um, the leftist internationalism during the era of post-colonial Indonesia. And of course, after that, we have also some few questions regarding, well, the existence of Indonesia and of course, a very interesting discussion as well um, during how, during the um, Indonesian era of how, well, in responding to the, the different leftists in the world, you could say. Maybe um, to well to limit on the time because we've already reached seventeen fifty. Um, maybe for Mr. Didi, do you want? Do you have any uh, closing remarks? Uh, I, I am not that age yet that I would have a closing remarks. But um, if if anyone have, I, I think I'm more interested in any contestation. So uh, what uh, must uh, Becky? Bekisma earlier uh, when he was talking about oh like whether my interpretation of um, of uh, I did um, sort of critique of Stalinism is somewhat overstretched I think that's kind of question that I or that's kind of contestation that I that I want to hear more because I'm I, I would say if I pass uh, this audience I think I would feel much more confident in <laughs> in in pre in talk in discussing about this issue elsewhere because I think it all starts from here. 
that's the, the, that's very true, especially according to the different perspective and the different interpretations of the writings. I think that's very, um, yeah, that's very troubling as well because we couldn't really research a lot because, yeah, due to the 65 tragedy, we couldn't really found any more materials to research on. That's very unfortunate. Um, and maybe for um, for the audience, I'm really, really sorry. I saw someone use the raise hand method, but unfortunately due to the time constraint, we couldn't really um, uh, move on with this. So maybe to, yeah, after that closing remarks from Mr. Titi, um, I would <laughs> go over to Mr. Ausoff again. Mas? Okay, thank you, Fawaz. Uh, thank you again for Mr. Titi and Fawaz for the remarkable discussion. And I also want to thank everyone for staying and participating in our discussion today, especially Mr. Titi and Fawaz for the great occasion. Uh, let's give Let's give them an applause, <laughs> an artificial applause, I think. And so if anyone want to rewatch or replay this discussion, uh, the record of this discussion will be available on our YouTube channel, Sejarah Lintas Batas. Uh, the link is mentioned below on the chat column. With our... It's... Oh, okay, you just you just could search Sejarah Lintas Batas on YouTube. Uh, thank you again. Uh, see you next time. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Kita sampai ketemu ya. Halo. Halo. <laughs> sampai ketemu ya. Ya, ya. Ya, di Indonesia ya. 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 Thank you, Titi. Ya, ya terima kasih juga Mas Andi. Interesting uh, topics. <laughs> Can discuss it later. Keep in touch. Okay. Yeah, stay in touch. Um, Thank you.